Eh, así que vamos a tener que hacerle un poquito eh, eh, una interpretación casera, eh, pero seguro que nos vamos a organizar bien, sobre todo que esta sesión va a ser de reuniones eh, individuales con el facilitador eh, Víctor eh, Fonseca. Eh, pero antes de pasar a la presentación de eh, lo que fue el trabajo de ayer por la tarde, de que los relatores nos hablen eh, de lo que se hizo, de lo que se concluyó en las reuniones de ayer, tenemos un anuncio que hacerles, Soledad Abarca va a anunciarles algo, así que vamos a tomar unos minutos de, de su tiempo. I will say now in English, I'm sorry I cannot say it in Portuguese. Um, so this morning it was foreseen uh, for the individual coaching of uh, projects that you have, that you identified uh, yesterday in the working groups, uh, projects to nominate uh, documentary heritage either for the regional or the international registers. So you will be doing that. We will be hearing from the rapporteurs and then uh, you will be able to uh, discuss with Victor, our facilitator, uh, Victor Fonseca, who will be able to uh, coach you to advise uh, on how to uh, prepare those nominations. But before we start that work, uh, we have an announcement to make. Actually, Soledad Tabarca has an announcement to make. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to take a few more minutes uh, from your time. So Soledad, please. Hola, muy buenos días. Eh, estoy muy contenta de poder hacer este anuncio eh, en nombre del uh, de la Biblioteca Nacional y, y especialmente del eh, Servicio Nacional del Patrimonio Cultural que pertenece al Ministerio de las Culturas, las Artes y el Patrimonio en Chile, que eh, seremos y estamos muy felices de ser sede de la próxima reunión de MOULAC en Santiago a fines de noviembre. Yo estoy muy contenta. Uh, I'm very pleased to announce that the next uh, venue for the meeting of MOLAC uh, will be at the end of uh, November in Santiago de Chile at the National Library, of course. <laughs> I'm very happy to announce that and, and we will be very pleased to uh, be able to make a joint uh, meeting with uh, the Servicio Nacional del Patrimonio Cultural Uh, that belongs to the Ministry of Culture in Chile. So um, we are looking forward to see you all, <laughs> or most of you, and, and do something meaningful. We will be speaking also about, well, the, the traditional meeting that you have to work <laughs> and, and to discuss, but we will also be talking a little bit of uh, illicit trafficking eh, vamos a hablar también de tráfico ilícito durante la reunión porque hemos tenido un apoyo de la unidad de tráfico ilícito del servicio del patrimonio. Así que nos interesa mucho poder recibirlos y que conozcan el patrimonio documental chileno también. We look forward to uh, share with you our experiences and, and, and show you uh, our uh, documentary heritage. Well. Thank you, thank you uh, so much, uh, Soledad, for hosting us. And um, on behalf of, no, 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 oh, you stay, oh, you stay, no, not no, yet, no, not yet, no, yet. <laughs> one more minute. So on behalf of UNESCO, thank you very much. And now I would like uh, that Peter says a few words, uh, a few words on behalf of uh, MOLAC, unas palabras de Peter uh -huh. como presidente del MOLAC. So Soledad, thank you. And thank you also to our Rodrigo. MOLAC <laughs> member, Rodrigo, to, yeah, to, be able to announce it right now. We were talking about it for quite a while now, and it's really important for us to um, it's to have this um, definite answer in that we're able to have our meeting in such a beautiful place. I've seen the pictures of your national library, and it would, will be a great opportunity to talk with Uh, the library and archival professionals over there and also to meet with the other members of the National Memory of the World Committee and hopefully we'll have meaningful talks not just in the closed meetings but also in other opportunities open opportunities to um, yeah, to engage with professionals so thank you so much for making this possible and yeah we'll meet again in just a few months so thank you very much 
Thank you, Peter, and thank you all. Gracias. Gracias. <laughs> Thank you, Rosa. Now we will see the video. Please. O vídeo que vem, veremos é, foi gravado por especialistas sobre questões And mais comuns. Eu gostaria de falar hoje sobre o denominação do processo. Ok, siga. Para a Unesco, eu lembro que vamos registrar as denominações. Apenas uma breve apresentação sobre os key points em entender a forma e como adressar e fazer os critérios. These seem to be the most important things that people um, have problems with understanding. So, um, hence we'll do this. Just, just bits of the form, not all of it, just the bits, bits that are critical. Um, first of all, the title. Uh, this is a, might seem like a very obvious point, but it's actually something that's quite important. If it's, if it's a nice, short, catchy title, it's more likely to catch attention. Uh, so keep it simple, keep it down to three or five words, not a long sentence. Um, try and keep it short. Uh, a maximum of 10 words, that's enough. Um, and there's a few examples there of um, the kinds of titles that um, are easy to remember, are catchy. People will reduce it to that anyway. So uh, try and think of a, a short framing for your nomination. The summary. This is a really important part of the, of the nomination. It might seem like something uh, you've just brush over, but it's, it's absolutely critical because people read this first and it gives them the first snapshot the first of your nomination, uh, what you're going to be talking about. And we suggest you write it last because you've got all the information that you've assembled for the nomination. It's already been written about. You've, you've got everything clear in your mind. So the most important points are what goes in the summary. So it's always a good idea to leave that bit until the last and then come back to it and once you have done everything else. Uh, we call this a shop window. This is where we put the most important things. You don't cram a shop window full of things that people can't differentiate. You always put something, just a few items you want people to catch, look, look at. And in this case, we want to look at the most important points about your nomination. You have plenty of opportunity in the nomination form to talk about all the things you need to talk about to describe your documentary heritage. There's many opportunities to describe all sorts of things about it. Uh, so don't, don't be too detailed in this spot. Just 200 words is enough. So we're jumping on here. Uh, this is to the uh, section six of the form, the identity and description of the documentary heritage item or collection, the history or the provenance of your documentary heritage. And what it's asking you to do is, this, is to set out the history of the item or the collection, its life story, or what we call provenance, the time it was created to its place in your institution. So where it started, what happened to it along the way, and how it came to be in your collection. And this is critical to establishing a really, really important part of the Memory of the World program, the authenticity of the document. If we know everything that's happened to a document, where it's been all through its life story, we are more confident that what we're talking about is an authentic document, one that's, that is real, a genuine article. Some of these documents, of course, are very old. You may not know all the details. You might not even have much to say, but, you, but as much as you can, you can provide in terms of, of what's happened to this document through its life uh, to give as comprehensive an account of the item or collection's provenance as you can. And that way it will help us to understand how authentic it is and that it is authentic. So this is very, it's very important that you 
address this criteria. And then we jump on to number seven, again, the assessment against the selection criteria. And this is the really the heart of your nomination. This is where the arguments about why your collection is important, why it's, it should be part of the memory of the world. This is, these, are, these are the arguments you need to make to make that case. So the first thing we say to you is play to your strengths and choose the criteria that best express the qualities of your documentary heritage item or collection. And it's very important to understand you don't need to address every single one if it's not relevant. So you look at the ones that you think are going to be the ones that are going to best give you the chance to showcase your nomination and you choose those. You don't try and address those that don't have any application. And you craft your responses to match the criteria. The quiz is going to ask you questions about what's significant about this documentary heritage. Don't simply repeat material that you put down somewhere else in the nomination form, whether it be in the history and provenance section or in the description or, or, the, or the cataloging or whatever. Um, make sure you directly address the criteria. Don't just keep plonking bits of text in that you think is going to match that particular criteria. There are two sets of, pro, of criteria, the primary criteria, and these are the ones we're going to talk about now, and there are the, what we call the comparative criteria, and I'll come to those in a few minutes' time. Um, the primary criteria help you to understand the significance value of your documentary heritage for the world. Now, the way the form is set out is created a few problems for some people. We've noticed looking at some of the draft nominations that people have been putting a lot of information just under 7.1, which is a question. Does your documentary heritage item or collection meet one or more of the primary criteria? You just leave that. That's a heading. You don't, you don't actually put anything under, under 7.1 itself, under that particular little, um, little point. It's simply a section heading. You focus on the criteria from 7.1.1 onwards and address them under each of those criteria. You don't put anything under 7.1. That is simply a question of does your documentary heritage item or collection meet one or more of the criteria? And as I said, if there's three primary criteria, there's historical significance, form and style, and social, community, and spiritual significance. I'm going to explain what all these are in a minute. Uh, but you only choose and address the criteria that are relevant to your nominated documentary heritage. Not all criteria will necessarily apply. It's quite interesting to see how few actually fit under some of these criteria. I'm going to go and talk about the next the primary criteria now just so that you get an understanding of how each of these is different from the other one and what you need to put in under each one. So 7.1.1 historical significance. This is one that is the most common, every, just about everything we have in our collections, of course, has some historical significance. It was created at a particular point in time for a particular reason, um, under the stress of certain circumstances, and it has its place in history. So virtually everything has some historical significance. And there's a series of questions here that ask you, what does the documentary heritage item or collection tell us about the history of the world? Does it deal with political, economic, or social, or spiritual movements, leading personalities in world history, events of world changing significance, specific places of significance, traditional customs, relations with other countries or communities, changing patterns of life and culture, a turning point in history, or a critical innovation? An example of excellence in the arts, literature, science, technology, sport, or other aspects of life and culture. Of course, there's some prompt questions to get you to think about what, what is it actually telling us about history of the world. So these are, these are, you don't need to put anything under each of these. These are just prompt questions that get you to think about what historical significance could be in your document, documentary heritage. 
I've got a few examples of what we call historical significance here today. Here's an example from Namibia in Africa of the letter journals of Henry Goodboy. Uh, these are really important journals, but a, a leading um, African national hero, uh, Henry Goodboy. And he struggled against the German occupation of Namibia. Uh, and uh, just in the last couple of weeks, we've, we've been told that the Germans are now going to pay Namibia reparations of over a billion euros for what they did to Herero and Nama tribesmen in, and peak tribes people in Namibia in the late 19th century and early 20th century. So this man was the first person to really, really develop the concept of Pan-Africanism. A very, a very key figure is letters journals are held in the National Archives of, of Namibia in Windhoek. And uh, I've been privileged to go there and see them, as some other of my colleagues will be with you in this workshop have as well. Uh, it's a, so he's a leading figure in history for all sorts of reasons. He started a political movement and he's a national hero for his country, but also for the wider African community. So that's, that's where he sits in terms of historical significance. And of course, the time and place is important to the time of colonial empires and uh, the kinds of exploitation of places like Africa that took place in those, in those times. So historical significance, of course, is clearly what Henry Woodboy's letters and journals are about. Uh, these are these sort of movements of people and, and particular labour circumstances. This is the, a story of indentured labour, indentured people who, who signed up. plantations in places like Fiji and the Pacific, um, people needed labour and they imported labour. People came from places like Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Suriname and Fiji, uh, or went to those places, um, from India. Uh, they had plenty of people signed up to go and live there. And of course, it changed the demographics of many of these countries. Um, Fiji is now almost totally 50% Indian. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago has also got a large Indian population. So these, these movements of people, labour movement, um, in response to an economic situation, uh, an industry that needed to have labour, uh, and these, these particular uh, documents are held in National Archives of Fiji, on the one hand, the one piece of paper is from National Archives of Fiji, and the South Sea Island indentured labourers. This is another movement of people from the Pacific, into uh, Queensland in my country. Uh, same reasons, sugar plantations needed labour and indentured labourers were hired from the countries of the Pacific, not often in the best possible circumstances. Some of them, they called blackbirded, they were kidnapped and brought there, but others signed labour agreements. And these are the registers from the Queensland State Archives to uh, talk about who came from the, the islands of the Pacific work in the sugar plantations in Queensland. So that's about movement of people, economics, and about um, the changing demographics of particular countries. So that's historical significance. The second one is form and style. And this one is about the physical nature of the nominated documentary heritage. Uh, what it is it made of? What is it like to look at? Um, does it have outstanding qualities of beauty and craftsmanship? Is it a new or unusual type of carrier? Of course, that you will have been told a carrier is the item that supports uh, the actual content of the document. Or is it an example of a type of document that has now disappeared? So there's all sorts of ways of looking at the physical nature. Uh, it's not just about, you don't put in, it is a manuscript or it is a pile of, of paper or whatever. It's a, if it's something unusual, something different, um, our outstanding is a beautifully illuminated manuscript, uh, for example, or if it's, if it's something innovative in terms of, um, of documentation, or is it something that we don't have anymore that is now very unusual. So form and style is quite specific to that materiality of the documentary heritage. I'll give you some examples of what we're talking about here. 
This one here is a uh, what they call a Nashi Dongba pictogram script from Yan'an province in China. This is an ancient script, an early form of writing. So it's a very unusual kind of document. And it's, it's composed of little pictures. As you can see, a bit like Egyptian hieroglyphics, only a bit more graphic in many ways. You can actually recognize animals and, and other figures in, in those quite easily. And it is one that is a, was very much an endangered language. It was um, suppressed and, uh, for a long time and, and in the period in China under the Cultural Revolution, and people were not encouraged to use it. But since that time, there's been some um, liberalisation, and people are now encouraged to um, practice and to, and to write the script again. So this is in Yan'an province in China, a different kind of script, very unusual. And wood box. These were an unusual kind of carrier as well. I mean, they were used for printing everywhere, but these are the Tripitaka Koreana scriptures from the Heianza Temple in the Republic of Korea. And they are, of course, uh, very famous as um, documentary heritage in a world heritage site. Uh, but they are also, um, for their own, their own character, their own nature, they're wood blocks. They're not pieces of paper. They're not... Um, film, things like that. So they have a, a, their own form and style, which is distinctive. Okay. And finally, in the primary criteria, social, community or spiritual significance. And this one is quite hard to explain and quite hard for many people to grasp. It's about people's attachment to the documentary heritage of a specific community in the present. And you must show how this is demonstrated. So it's about people who are attached to the heritage of the beloved community leader. So that the thing he things he or she created are in fact powerful objects that have got people very revere them. Uh, attachment to the documentary heritage of a specific incident or site. Um, people are also attached to those those kinds of things. Um, and in in terms of spirituality. Um, Documentary heritage is associated with a spiritual leader or a saint. Some belief systems have um, saints and, and other um, revered spiritual beings and something associated with them. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, in Christianity, uh, reveres saints. So things that are associated with them are essentially worshipped um, as part of, of, their, of their, their spiritual qualities. And you need to show how this attachment is expressed by our community. How do, they, how do people show that they care about this documentary heritage? Um, and there's a really good example. In, again, in the Republic of Korea, um, the Human Rights Documentary Heritage 1980 archives for the May 18th Democratic Uprising against the military regime in Gwangju. Uh, it is um, people who went through this really, tough, really bad time uh, in, in 1980. Many people were killed. A lot of them were very young. A lot of them were university students and they, and they were, were killed. And it's very humbling to go to the, the cemetery in Guangzhou and see the graves, with the pictures of uh, very young people who were killed in this uprising. And the survivors of this uprising and the people who look after records in Guangzhou have have preserved these things in a, in a very large archive and the whole city of Guangzhou is the persona of human rights city. So the city, whole city identifies with this uprising as a key moment, as given them an identity and, and you can see a, a ceremony um, and an academic conference around, around this particular uh, commemoration of this particular event. Uh, a few years ago. I think they still have one every year. Again, another, another um, series of records that relate to people being oppressed and being liberated. And this is in, in a place called the Dominican Republic in Santo Domingo, the capital city. It's the Museum of the Resistance, Memorial Museum of the Resistance to the Trujillo regime. It was a dictatorship that lasted 30 years. Um, that Trujillo was a, a oppressive ruler. Uh, many people were killed, uh, tortured, executed. Uh, there was massive resistance. And finally, um, Trujillo uh, was overthrown. And the, the survivors of that particular moment you know, created this, this 
collection of archives and people, young people these days are, are taught about this, uh, this particular uprising and it's very much part of their, their life as well. So, again, it's not just documents on a shelf. It's something people really relate to as a key part of their identity. So those are the primary criteria. And so you look at each of those, you decide which one applies or if all of them apply to your documentary heritage or just one, this is the historical significance or form and style. Um, usually if something's got historical significance, it might have social and spiritual significance or it may not, depending on whether you can prove that attachment. Uh, the last set of criteria are the comparative criteria. And the first of these is rarity. And this is, of course, it means whether, whether there's very few of these items that are still left in circulation. And rarity, of course, is, a, is an indication of value in many, in, many, in many marketplaces. And the same thing happens in documentary heritage. So is the documentary heritage item or collection rare? And there's two ways of being rare. One is if it's one of a kind, if it's unique, the only one ever created. Or is it a survivor of a form of documentary heritage that was once widespread? And do you know about other documentary heritage article collections that are the same as this elsewhere? Comparative criteria I should have mentioned briefly before, uh, they help us assess the degree of significance. So you've, you've established your primary reason for having your documentary heritage, but these things talk about how rare it is or how how significant it is compared to other sorts of documentary heritage like it. So you've got two sorts of rarity. You've got one that's unique, the uniqueness of something, something that's only ever been created once, or one that is the only one left after time has taken other things out. So you, a rare art would be one of a kind, and we've got an example here, the Benz patent of 1886 for the internal combustion engine from Germany. There's only one Benz patent, only ever been one. Um, there's a number of reproductions of the actual vehicle. People have made these models that uh, you can see here. Uh, but the actual patent, which is the design you see on the screen, that is the only one that has ever existed. A patent means that once you patent something, of course, you say, this is it, and you own it, and there can't be any more of that particular thing. But that's So that's the one of a kind. There's only one of these. But a rare item is, can also be a survivor. And the, the book here you can see here is a document that was once common. It was a printed book. So printed books, of course, are circulated. People have uh, multiple copies. But now only one copy or a few copies survive. And we only know of one of these. This is, this is a catechism. It's a, a, a Catholic a religious book written in a language called Papiamento. Papiamento was the Creole language, the, the language developed in a place called the Netherlands Antilles in the, in the Caribbean Sea. And this was um, developed by a missionary to, to um, the Netherlands Antilles, to Curacao in this case. And this was actually published and circulated and only one survives that we know about. We don't know of any others in the world, but because people you know, lose them, they get damaged and so on. So it, it's a rarity as well because it's a survivor. Um, the next, next comparative criterion is integrity, completeness and condition. So is the documentary heritage item or collection complete or are sections or pages missing? You need to, start, you need to tell us. Are uh, supplementary parts preserved elsewhere? If so, tell us about those too. And what condition is it in? Is it in good condition or is it damaged? It's just one of those things we need to know about in terms of um, how to assess it. So we come to the last item, which is the statement of significance. And this is, people don't, I think it's, it's hard to say, see that people have grasped this one, it's, but it is the most important part of your whole document. Because uh, what you do is you summarise the points you've made in 7.1 and 7.2. So all the points you've made about the, the primary criteria, all the points you've made about the second, the comparative criteria, and it, then you answer the following questions. So you've got a summary of historical significance and whatever else happens after that. 
uh, whether something's rare or whether it's what condition it's in and so on. And then you then you address these questions. Why is this documentary heritage item or collection important to the memory of the world? This is you make your case. And what has been the impact of this item or collection on world history and culture? So what's it says, what's its influence been? And in terms of the international registry, even the regional registers, what has been its impact beyond a nation, state, or region? This will help us decide what where, where it fits in the scheme of things. If it's had an impact outside its country or outside the region, that is what we're talking about here. And how would it's lost impoverished the heritage of humanity? What would happen if we lost this particular item documentary heritage? This, these are all points you need to answer in the statement of significance. Um, but you remember, once you've written this, you can then go back to your summary and you put the key points from this in your summary at the front of the paper. So these are the parts of the, of the document that we've, we have discovered people have most problems with, uh, which is why I focused on them. They're the key points that we need to have addressed. Uh, we certainly will be helping you with any of these when we come to the workshop. And I hope that this has made it a bit clearer for you um, as you fill out your nomination form. So thank you. Hello. Yeah, please. Just a little note that um, we are going to share this video and other materials after this meeting to all participants. So don't worry, you will get the best from us. Thank you, Jim. Now I invite Mr. Papa Moma Diop to speak his final considerations, please. Yo tengo mucha mucha cosa que decir ah, eh, después de la intervención de de, 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 de nuestra colega. I have no uh, thing to add to uh, uh, our colleague. Uh, from uh, from New Zealand or Australia, uh, yes. Uh, just just say, uh, my intention was to uh, to speak about criteria, as as I tell you yes uh, yesterday. But it is not use, useful now. But uh, I would like uh, to take this opportunity to speak about uh, two items of memory of the world program. Uh, uh, that uh, a lot of people don't know. It is the Jackie Price and the Knowledge Centers. The Square, is, uh, uh, the subcommittee, uh, Education and Research, has created a system at the request uh, by the International Advisory Committee uh, to, uh, to create uh, uh, over in the world uh, uh, network of knowledge center. I have not time to, to, to go to the details, but you can go to, uh, for those who, da who don't know, uh, they, they, ca they uh, can go to the uh, UNESCO uh, Memory of the World website. There is uh, uh, details. It written that uh, there, is, there are uh, now uh, seven knowledge centers uh, in which uh, uh, one from Africa in Cote d'Ivoire at the University of uh, U U uh, Virtual University of Abidjan. That's a lone African, uh, African uh, knowledge center. The other ones are in Asia, in Korea, China, and uh, in Mexico. The, the second item is the uh, Gigi Prize. Gigi Prize. Uh, Prize is a prize of uh, UNESCO and the uh, uh, Republic of Korea to uh, to uh, recompense 
to reward yes to reward good efforts done by uh, uh, by uh, people and institution to uh, promote and to preserve uh, to 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 give better pre preservation and accessibility to documentary heritage so uh, you can you can go through the uh, website of uh, memory of the world and you, you you'll see the details uh, apologize for for bad english Thank you, Mr. Papa. Now I invite me, Mr. John Pedro, John Pedro da Cunha Lourenço to report his consideration about Palop Group. Please. Bom dia a todos. Uh, eu, vou eu vou começar por falar em espanhol e quero pedir desculpa do meu inglês. Uh, assim, pelo menos com espanhol, cobrimos uma parte. Quando o meu inglês sair ruim, os que falam melhor uh, inglês e entendem espanhol vão corrigir. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, uh, me gostaria sobre... Eh, el encuentro de ayer, inicialmente agradecer a, a nuestro, nuestro consultor, Víctor Fonseca, que hace más de un mes eh, tiene trabajado con nosotros y <coughs> entonces ayer nos permitió que, eh, que pudiéramos definir lo que estamos preparando. Hace poco, como... Tenemos cinco minutos, voy a hacer, eh, voy a presentar unos apuntes. Lo, lo primero que ficou, lo que quedó planteado es que tenemos los, los cinco países, en, nuestro, en este caso los cuatro, que tenemos que definir que, que aquella documentación que es, su contenido es partidado, tenemos que trabajar en un proyecto común. Por ejemplo, eh, la cuestión del Tratado luso Británico y de la Comisión luso Británico de Combate al Tráfico Ilícito de la Esclavitud, que es, por ahora sabemos que es común entre Angola, Cabo Verde y Guinea-Bissau, uh, y, y Mozambique, y el compañero de Guinea-Bissau va a verificar se lo tenemos. Por otro lado, tenemos que trabajar en candidaturas individuales que tiene que ver con eh, o con la lucha de liberación o con o, o con, con otras cuestiones que tenemos que presentar. En el caso de Angola, vamos a trabajar en un proyecto de tráfico de esclavo, pero para presentar detalles que puede ser que ahora no están muy representados en, en, en los documentos que están en Memorias del Mundo. En el caso de Mozambique, de Mozambique eh, nuestro compañero eh, presentó la posibilidad de que eh, después, eh, después o antes de la prohibición de, de, de tráfico de la esclavitud en, en, en las colonias portuguesas, hay un, como un incremento eh, por la costa del Pacífico y la idea es presentar, como el tráfico de esclavos está muy ligado a la cuestión del transatlántico, entonces el ineditismo de esta documentación puede ser muy, muy útil para la candidatura. En el caso de Guinea-Bissau, eh, se presentó la posibilidad de que se pueda trabajar la documentación de, de Paulo Freire, que por un proyecto que presentó en Guinea Bissau eh, y que puede ser una extensión de lo que ya está en, en la memoria del mundo, pero eh, nuestro compañero de Guinea Bissau eh, vaya a llegar a su país y ver para concretar qué documentos vamos a presentar. En términos de cronograma de trabajo, eh, 
hasta el 20 de este mes tenemos que definir y presentar a, a nuestro consultor qué es lo que cada uno de nosotros vamos a presentar. Y después lo haremos todo para que hasta el, hasta el 15 de noviembre, si no estoy, sí, en mis apuntes lo tengo aquí, para que el 15 de noviembre, ten, 10 de noviembre, 10 de noviembre, ya estaba robando unos cinco días más, para que hasta el 15, de, 10 de noviembre, tengamos una, una versión que, que sea, pero cada parte de, 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 del formulario que vamos rellenando, lo vamos a enviar a él para que él eh, pueda, pueda comentar, pueda hacer sus gestiones, y para que el 10 de noviembre lo ten, tengamos una versión que, que pueda estar lista para, eh, para ser corregida y, y presentada. ¿no? Eh, en base a eso es lo que... Lo que, nos, lo que nosotros discutimos ayer. Eh, no sé si, si mis compañeros de Guinea Bissau o, o, o quieren dar algo, o si nuestro consultor entiende que hay algo que, que quedó para, para aclarar. ¿no? Eh, lo siento, después de portugués y español es, es lo que mejor me sale, me sale lo siento. <risa> Gracias. <risa> Muchas gracias, Joan. Now I invite Miss Joan Osborne, Molac Regional Advisor, to report his considerations about Caribbean Group. Good morning, everyone. Um, I was very happy for the meeting of the Caribbean group to discuss. Cus, 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 cus. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Soka. <laughs> you sound the fact. The Caribbean group, and we were very happy to have. Stabanda there because he was able to answer many questions which we had about nominations which we are contemplating would be submitted for the cycle of the um, on the international register. The we discussed approximately six six collections which we are hoping would be submitted to the international and the regional register from St. Lucia, Margot Thomas yeah. <laughs> is in the process of working on the John Robert Lee collection. He has, is a poet and his collection of poems, essays, and literary papers, his works have been included in a number of Caribbean publications, such as Caribbean Verse, the Oxford Book of Caribbean Verse, Poetry, Wales, Small Acts, etc. And he has been honored by the University of the West Indies from the his collection, we can see that there's regional significance. I'm hoping that, um, that Margot will be able to complete that nomination to be first in line for the next cycle of the regional register. Um, for the international register, we discuss three, five collections, five applications, which we hope would go forward that for St. Lucia, Margot is working on two nominations. One, the Rick Wayne collection. Um, Rick Wayne is really one of the first black bodybuilders to participate in that sport. And because of that, he had to face a lot of racism. He has written his book, his book on muscle wars. 
his collection is very wide. I think it's at the archives in St. Lucia and um, it cuts across his experience as a bodybuilder, also as a pop singer in Britain and an advocate. He was also an advocate for the rights of women, girls and boys, etc. And um, his complete set, I believe, is at the National Archives in St. Lucia. And he has, from his wide experience in the sport of bodybuilding, and because it cuts across the, the globe, it sounds that it has real international reach. And therefore, we hope that the nomination will be successful. The other collection is the Derek Walcott collection, Nobel laureate Debra Walcott, Derek Walcott. Now his collection is already on the International Register so that it will be an addition. But Margot has indicated that there are many parts of his collection, some of which are in St. Lucia, some in other private institutions that really should be added to the current nomination. It was nominated in 1997. So that, that will be an addition to the nomination that is already on the International Register that has already been accepted. For Trinidad and Tobago, the National Library in Trinidad is working on three nominations from three different institutions. NALIS has, the National Library has part of the collection. One is Pearl into Springer collection. The other is Soka, Monarch, the um, Star, Marshall Montano, and the Leroy Clark collection. He's a master artist and painter. This collection is being nominated by his foundation, which he started and which he felt would take his work forward even after he has passed and he has passed. We had hoped that it would have been nominated before, but because of the interruption, in the um, whole nomination process at the international level, right, we were not able to submit it and well, he has passed during that time. So we are hoping that it can go through for in the cycle. Pearl into Springer is one, uh, a poet. She's a librarian. We claim her as one of our own, right? Very, 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 very dynamic lady. As a matter of fact, she has been my, um, my bed too. I look up to her, her work, etc. She is also a poet. She's also a playwright. She's a major activist for women's rights, indigenous rights, for any, for, she has been working um, assiduously for um, young people. She is, as an activist, she uses her skills um, in theater and her writing, her poems, etc., to fill gaps in the literature that, um, that doesn't exist in order to, to promote her, her people, to promote African people, to promote indigenous people. For example, there was not a, any play or anything like that any on um, emancipation and the whole emancipation process and recognizing that she has recently done a play and it has been going for now and it has been published in um, her book of plays. The whole carnival, everyone in Trinidad and Tobago is known for his carnival and um, how carnival started. There were riots, people actually fought for carnival and she began her whole process by reenacting that battle on Carnival Friday. And she began as oral, just doing the play. And she has recently published 
the the play on the start of carnival it brings tears to your eyes really on carnival friday morning when you look at that reenaction because you think of carnival just being fun and games and joy and so on but when you actually see what people had to go through in order to have that proclamation that you can now go and revel in the streets it is really something you see so that i think that it is a, um, a collection that has a lot of international reach apart from that for the african people of african origin their rights to to marry under orisha she has been the really the brainchild and like the midwife to nurture that whole process to have the orisha act marriage act passed in trinidad and tobago I think it's the only one of its kind, and she has been all over um, giving lectures at conferences and so on on the Orisha Marriage Act. And because that Orisha Marriage Act was passed, then there are other groups, marginalized groups in the country who were able to have their marriage acts passed, like the Hindu community. So she also works very closely with the other ethnic groups within the society so that any wrong doing, she's an activist for everybody. So I think that will be excellent nomination um, that we are going to put forward. Peter spoke, and spoke about the nomination for the unslaved registers that he, for Aruba to add the Aruba um, contribution and their collection to the, the collection that is already on the register, the International Register, the Slave Registers. And um, because there are some countries that were not part of that original nomination, so this is one that we hope will be added in this new cycle. And I think that is the end of our fruitful discussions. It was very, 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 very enlightening. And I'm hoping that we have these dominations on the, in this cycle of the International Register and of course, certainly to have additional um, nominations on the Regional Register. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I invite Ms. Anna Ribeiro <laughs> to report with his, her considerations about American, Latin American group. Okay. Bom dia. Os países presentes ontem na tarde, quando a gente falou toda junta da América Latina, se foram Brasil, Paraguai, Guatemala, Costa Rica e Uruguai. Então, quatro países de fala em espanhol, um país de fala em português, eu tenho o direito a falar em espanhol, não é? Bom, bueno, estes cinco países que estivemos ayer presentes discutindo, vimos que era muito difícil para todos, separar la situación política de la situación cultural. Así que las nominaciones, el funcionamiento de los comités, el funcionamiento de las comisiones nacionales, no están aislados del mundo que nos rodea, y cada uno de los países cuando explicó a qué se postula y cómo viene preparando su trabajo, tuvo indefectiblemente que hacer una mención a la situación política. Y cuando detalle este, cada uno de los países, ustedes comprenderán exactamente a qué me refiero. Costa Rica, que tiene un comité que integra todas las instituciones vinculadas con la memoria, biblioteca, archivo, Academia de Geografía Nacional, Historia, Academia de Ciencias, que funciona desde 2006, tiene 24 nominaciones nacionales, tres regionales y una internacional a propósito de la abolición del ejército. Para esta, para esta ocasión 
en, en este llamado de Moulak, tiene tres trabajos que va a presentar. Una, uno de ellos es la postulación de la sede de la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, la otra es la Academia de Geografía e Historia y la otra tiene que ver con material del Archivo Nacional. En el caso de Paraguay, lo que les decía al principio es aún más notorio, Paraguay tiene una sola inscripción del año 2009 y es nada menos que el Archivo del Terror, que tiene que ver con el, presente, con el pasado reciente. Desde 2014 no se presenta ni se reúne ni el Comité ni la Comisión Nacional que fue creado en 2012 y aún siendo creado en 2012 tuvieron solo tres reuniones. Están preparando una postulación con un archivo del arzobispado y que tiene que ver con la familia paraguaya y es un documento que registra los índices de soltería de Paraguay. El, la segunda postulación tiene que ver con la biblioteca de Enrique Solano López y estamos nuevamente, como hablábamos el primer día, con los grandes hombres, las grandes familias, aunque en el caso de la soltería tendríamos un registro de la población más este, anónima. La representante de Paraguay aquí presente, Rosa, nos habla de una creciente dificultad política que tiene que ver con un clima de crecimiento cultural, pero también de crecimiento de, cier de cierta violencia que incide en la reunión del comité y en, la, en las postulaciones. Tienen candidaturas naturales que ella piensa que van a concretar en breve, o por lo menos va a intentarlo, y la reunión de ayer significó una manifestación de ayuda por parte de otros países para ver si algo del riquísimo mundo guaraní logra concretar una postulación. Mundo guaraní es una postulación porque fue lengua de catequización, lengua de evangelización y por lo tanto es una lengua más extendida que la etnia guaraní en sí misma. Y también tienen un importante registro de las donaciones que hicieron las mujeres de sus joyas para apoyar al Paraguay durante la guerra de la Triple Alianza y que tuvieron el triste destino de ser apropiados por este, Solano López para un uso que no era exactamente el que las mujeres habían pensado. De cualquier manera, ese día se festeja como el Día de la Mujer Paraguaya. Rosa, espero no haberme olvidado de nada. Guatemala nos dejó a todos un poco nerviosos porque parece que son los que hacen mejor los deberes. Por lo menos lo hacen todo muy bien. Tienen un sitio prehispánico, un calendario grabado en piedra que es nada menos que vinculado al Popol Vuh, ese antiquísimo documento indígena, y a su vez a ese patrimonio de la humanidad vinculado con una condición de sitio y con una condición arqueológica, asocian un registro en MOU, porque también hay papeles y, y, y piedra, y ambos documentan este, textos y documentan eh, religión y memoria de las poblaciones originales. Hay una parte de esta rica documentación que está en Estados Unidos y ese es un litigio por bienes culturales que acompaña estas nominaciones y que justo saberlo, la nominación siempre ayuda a la recuperación de los materiales perdidos o no devueltos. Hay en trabajo un proceso de pacificación, el que fue del año 96 al 98, de valor regional, que tiene que ver con esos acuerdos de paz y también es una postulación en, en curso. La novedad que a, nos aportó Guatemala es que el Estado guatemalteco registra todo lo que tiene que ver con memoria y que ese primer registro estatal que implica ayuda y compromiso estatal luego es utilizado por las propuestas de Moulac o de Mou cuando van a postularse a un nivel ya UNESCO mayor. Eh, de cualquier manera ellos también señalaron que hay buenos y malos momentos con el Estado o sea que ellos también tienen lo que les señalaba al, al, al principio están trabajando en dos registros uno de biodiversidad para usar una palabra al uso aunque en realidad se refiere 
al antiguo Fondo de Historia de la Capitanía del Reino de Guatemala y que también involucra al Popol Vuh. Otro que tiene que ver con el archivo de la Policía Nacional, que ya está protegido por el Estado y que va de 1880 a 1996. Y un tercero que es el archivo de las reparaciones a las víctimas del conflicto armado de 1960 a 1993. Está recién comenzado el trabajo, está en gestión, pero aspiran a que sea una postulación. Brasil también nos dejó nerviosos, pero por razones diferentes. Brasil tiene en su haber 111 nominaciones nacionales, 30 regionales y 11 internacionales. No es solamente este país inmenso y precioso que nos ha recibido en estas jornadas, sino que es un país que tiene un amplísimo registro. Sin embargo, su comité vio interrumpida su, su existencia y su funcionamiento eh, en el gobierno anterior y eso se ha reflejado en una, digamos, en una incógnita en cómo van a continuar. Por lo que pudimos ver, tienen una firme voluntad y todos los que fueron alguna vez integrantes del comité están trabajando para que éste reanude su funcionamiento. Tienen un interés muy grande en coordinar con África y como ya se dijo aquí, hay una combinación, una coordinación, perdón, que girará en torno del nombre del inmenso educador que fue Paulo Freire y que se hace específicamente con Guinea. En el caso de Uruguay, y dejé mi país para el final, porque ese no preciso mirar mucho los papeles, en el caso de Uruguay nosotros tenemos seis nominaciones, una colección de acuarelas que ofician como viejas fotografías del mundo colonial y del mundo de la independencia, de Besnes e Irigoyen, una colección de un naturalista exquisito que fue sacerdote, el padre de la Rañaga, que como naturalista tomó también dibujos de la naturaleza y tenía una colección inmensa y era un interlocutor válido en términos de, de igualdad, nada menos que con Bonplan, el gran compañero de Humboldt en sus viajes por América. También tenemos un, un archivo importante reconocido que gira en torno a Carlos Gardel, el archivo El Oriente, que era el coleccionista que hizo ese acopio. Ay, gracias, esa máquina me está volviendo loca desde que llegué. Este, tenemos el archivo de Carlos Quijano sobre pasado reciente, es un archivo a la vez intelectual y político de alta calidad. Tenemos algo compartido de pasado reciente y con archivos que podríamos todos llamar del terror con Brasil y una colección importantísima de fotografía de la guerra de la Triple Alianza también con Brasil. En este año y se presentaron, ahora ya se terminó el llamado, y Uruguay presentó tres postulaciones, cualquiera de ellas son muy buenas, solo podrán entrar dos, así que veremos qué dice el honorable jurado. Uno es un archivo de salud eh, realizado en torno a un gran médico y estudioso de la medicina como disciplina histórica que fue el, eh, Luis Morquio. Su archivo está vivo en una institución aún hoy de salud y es a la vez un archivo de salud y social. El otro es un archivo de música, eh, un coleccionista y musicólogo, Lauro Ayestarán, coleccionó todas y cada una de las formas populares de música, además de las formas de música clásica, así que coleccionó partituras, músicos individuales, memorias, este, es un archivo vivo que no para de crecer, y que ha sido muy acondicionado en los últimos tiempos, y por lo tanto eh, está recibiendo permanentemente donaciones musicales. Se relaciona con el proyecto Bandoneón, que UNESCO premió como un proyecto de fondos importantes el año pasado, y a este acervo, este año, se le acaba de sumar un inventario de todos los bandoneones, todos los ejecutantes de bandoneón, los bandoneonistas, y todos los luthiers, que saben reparar los bandoneones. Así que este archivo vivo acaba de elevar su postulación. Y por último, el Museo del Carnaval, que también tiene, es un género muy propio de Uruguay, que tiene dentro una manifestación de la población negra importante, que es el candombe. El carnaval de Uruguay se parece mucho al carnaval de Islas Canarias, tiene parodistas y tiene murga, 
pero tiene una manifestación de, de afrodescendientes poderosa que es el candombe, con tres toques de candombe, tres toques de tambor que han sido reconocidos como patrimonio inmaterial por UNESCO. Así que esa mezcla hace un carnaval que es muy largo, dura un mes entero el carnaval en Uruguay y se efectúan espectáculos en todo el país y en cada una de las ciudades. Ese museo del carnaval acopia toda esa documentación, trajes, sitios típicos, eh, música, sonido, pero tiene a su vez en su segundo piso un grupo de estudiantes bajo la dirección de una académica de prestigio que estudia académicamente el carnaval. Ese archivo académico y universitario también se presentó al MOULAC. Así que en Uruguay estamos contentos, pero sabemos que también nosotros tenemos oscilaciones que tienen que ver con el momento político, el comité de memoria existente en el periodo de gobierno anterior dejó de funcionar durante ese gobierno, no sabemos muy bien por qué, alguna forma de inoperancia, así que ahora reformulamos su composición, ya está firmado por el presidente de la República y estamos esperando las designaciones de cada una de las instituciones que fueron llamadas a formar el comité. Así que la última buena noticia de Uruguay es que también tendremos comité a partir del mes de, estamos en septiembre, octubre. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Ana. Now I invite Mr. Carlos Andújar from the Dominican Republic to speak his considerations about the event. Okay. Bien. Gracias por darme la oportunidad. Me dirijo en español. Hablo francés, español, no portugués ni inglés. Que son de las fra de los frax fragmentaciones del Caribe. Por razones de salud no pude venir ayer y quería explicar la situación de Santo Domingo porque vengo en representación de la, la parte dominicana. El Comité Dominicano de la Memoria funciona fuera de las situaciones políticas que puedan haber estado sucediendo los últimos 20 años en la República Dominicana. Eh, se inició a principios del siglo XX con el primer registro en el Museo de la Resistencia que cuenta la historia de los 31 años de la dictadura de Rafael Leonida Trujillo y cómo ese museo fue también reconocido como Patrimonio de la Memoria Universal. Luego de ese reconocimiento hemos tenido cuatro otros reconocimientos regionales. Uno dedicado al bautismo de los esclavos, 1500, 1600. Otro dedicado al folclore latinoamericano del Caribe, presentado por una institución del sector privado, que voy a hablar de la estructura también del comité brevemente. Otro dedicado a la, una revista de finales del siglo XIX que registra de una forma u otra lo que era la, el comportamiento social de la, de la zona de donde vino la revista, en el sur del país, de, de la República Dominicana. Y el último, que es una colección de fotografías del Centro Cultural Eduardo Lón Jiménez, que, está, eh, que es parte del sector privado, que, está parte, que es parte del comité y que acaba de ser reconocido eh, por el valor de la colección como eh, eh, testimonio, la fotografía como testimonio histórico, cultural, antropológico, sociológico, económico, que fue la vertiente que, que se presentó ese patrimonio regional, que acaba de ser reconocido por la UNESCO. Una de las dificultades que tiene el comité, no sé si pasa en otros países, es que los miembros del comité son a veces funcionarios, y cuando cambia el gobierno, cambian los funcionarios, y a veces se desacelera el trabajo del comité. Últimamente hemos cambiado la modalidad y estamos poniendo personalidades ligadas a la gestión de patrimonio de la memoria para que eso pueda avanzar. 
Y en este momento, después de este encuentro, nosotros tenemos, estamos trabajando la lista nacional, que fue lo que se planteó aquí antes de ayer, y la lista nacional primero presentada por las instituciones, y ahora de este evento me llevo a Santo Domingo la idea de comenzar a trabajar propuestas conjuntas, que es lo que más me ha interesado de este evento, que podemos presentar propuestas conjuntas, porque la historia, la sociedad y la cultura de República Dominicana está íntimamente ligada a la de toda la región, sobre todo al Caribe, que es el gran aporte que ha hecho este evento. Es decir, que estamos trabajando, tenemos ahora mismo la posibilidad, que lo vamos a consultar con Niño Fonseca, la posibilidad de ampliar esa lista, llevarlo a él como consultor, así como ha hecho con, con la gente de África, llevarlo allá para orientar, porque lo que más de brega da, no sé, a los otros comités, a nosotros, son los formularios, que son complicadísimos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Marco. Now the, the coffee break, please, in the lobby.
Hello. Now. Now. Yes. 
Retornando, é, com resuming, Vitor Fonseca, to speak his final considerations about the hybrid workshop. Good morning, everyone. Actually, I don't have very extensive comments on the event, but I would really like to thank uh, people for holding the event. I'd like to thank two people from Brazil, members of the Latin American Committee, the Latin American Caribbean Committee, Mauricio and myself. I also speak on behalf of Mauricio in the sense that we want to thank people for conducting the event. The shows and demonstrates first a predisposition on the part of the Brazilian state to resume a tradition, a strong tradition of participation and collaboration and, and sharing the experience with others, other countries, integration with the international heritage community. This is extremely important. And I think that I wish to thank the people the Brazilian government acknowledges great effort through the Guimarães Rosa Foundation and having contributed funding for the event. But I would also like to thank UNESCO and different administrative sectors as straight facts and Gian and all the work that went into that Gian developed over the course of over the time preparing this workshop, especially in the part pertaining to the Palop countries. It's extremely important and not only collaboration, the collaboration and action, but even the presence, having Fox and Bunda with us here. I think this we wish to acknowledge all the work done by UNESCO in Uruguay with Rosa, organizing and conducting this, all this, Adalto and the UNESCO team in Brazil and did all the work, a lot of work to find a place to establish partnership with the National Library here, promoting these administrative issues and operational issues, which sometimes are quite complicated, but they succeeded uh, getting the interpreters uh, coffee. It's uh, we call it uh, the brunch and the afternoon refreshments, such delicious refreshments. And I think this is great. And I want to thank everyone, everyone involved, and our colleagues from MOLAC and the members. Uh, Molek, Peter, Joan, Anna, Maris, who also, uh, Angus, everyone who were able to participate in our colleagues from the other countries as well who came or are attending online. I think that we actually heritage exists as a function of people because of people the mo most important of all are the people heritage exists and it's relevant and significant because it is significant for people's lives 
So the great major and key aspect that I'd like to highlight here is not just the issue, the, uh, the actual heritage and all the effort to show the significance and importance uh, in Latin America and Africa and the Caribbean with the role, the extremely important role in uh, Papa job in organizing with our colleagues from the Portuguese-speaking African countries with their participation here on this issue of the preservation and access all of this is extremely important because this has to do with people but it's interesting to realize that all this work is done by people and people that are involved engaged contributing their time their work and give their part of their lives and establishing ties which are extremely interesting all of this beyond the many professional ties of uh, camaraderie over time we observe and i see this when i look at my life which is uh, it's been several decades already in the international work for some time here in the international Council of Archives and so forth, how important it is for us to have established ties. And these ties oftentimes are not just camaraderie or as co workers, but those of friendship, true friendship, ties of friendship which help us to work and move forward. And I wish to say that, in a sense, this meeting here is also not only just a celebration of heritage, but a celebration of something which is important amongst people and it's important amongst nations, amongst societies. The idea that we have to work together, that we gain by working together, that work is better, it's lighter and it's more productive if we do it together. And I think that basically this meeting here which I'm certain which will result in numerous uh, strides and nominations and other initiatives probably. It is an example of this importance of collective work and interpersonal relations. Thank you very much. Basically, just acknowledging the value and the effort of everyone here organizing participating, discussing, coming to attend. So thank you very much. Uh, I think that it's possible to produce the photo, the official photo, is possible? Okay. Uh, Pia, please, to conduce for the, for in front of the, the, the building. This is the place, beautiful place to the photo. We return, okay? Thank you. 
Dando segmento, convido. Moving in now, I call forward to the front panel for the closing session of our MOLAC workshop. Uh, Professor Faxon Banda, please. From UNESCO. Oh, Minister Maris and Nakata from the uh, Gimenez Plaza Institute. Uh, thank you so much. Muito obrigado a todos. Eu gostaria de iniciar reconhecendo a presença ilustre do senhor Nakata, representando o Ministério de Relações Exteriores do Brasil. É importante reconhecer que o Ministério, através da Delegação Permanente Brasileira da Unesco, é, tem participado junto com nós a, a, o delegado atual permanente, o embaixador do Ministério de Relações Exteriores. Então, não é por coincidência que estejamos aqui. Ela, aliás, acho que tem uma visão clara de onde... Ministry to be in terms of forging stronger relationships uh, with, with Africa, uh, especially the Portuguese-speaking countries, uh, recognizing the huge uh, African diasporic community uh, here in Brazil and in throughout the rest of the Latin American Caribbean region. During the last um, uh, a few days, I have, I have seen several commitments and I'm happy that we, we have witnessed those. I, I'm happy to, to note that there is a stronger uh, commitment on the part of uh, Brazilian memory institutions uh, to promote trans-institutional cooperation, if you like, to work towards the re-establishment of uh, uh, the Brazilian National Committee for Memory of the World. I think that this is something that would like to commend uh, all of you that spoke so passionately yesterday about this issue. The Member of the World Program is eager to ensure that we have this national committee up and running again. I've also seen um, uh, another commitment here uh, among the the Palop countries that are represented um, at this at this workshop, that they have recognized uh, their shared um, um, cultural legacy, um, uh, and in their interactions with uh, Mr. Vito Fonseca, they have come to the conclusion that it might be invaluable to present um, uh, a joint you know, front, if you like, in looking at um, documentary collections that uh, bind them together, particularly those to do with uh, the, slave, the slave trade and how uh, it links them up, not only uh, uh, within Africa, but also with um, uh, uh, their diasporic counterparts here in Latin America and the Caribbean. I think that is a very good move. It will demonstrate um, to several other UNESCO member states that we in fact can forge stronger uh, 
uh, international cooperation among uh, African countries. So I'm very uh, excited about that particular issue. And you can be sure that we will support uh, you as much as possible in that respect. I am also happy about um, yet another commitment, which is between the regional committees, uh, the, the, the presence here of, uh, of, of, of ACMO and, and, and MOLAC is symbolic of that commitment to work together uh, between and among uh, regional committees. Uh, hopefully you can continue uh, to do this because it is only through such collaborative um, uh, ventures that we can realize the spirit of the 2015 recommendation about promoting uh, not only national, but also uh, international cooperation. So please continue uh, on that path, uh, assured that uh, you have um, uh, uh, a stronger supporter within uh, the Member of the World uh, program. Let me finally um, uh, recognize you know, my colleagues, um, uh, not only uh, uh, Diane, uh, uh, who works with me in, in the Unit for Documentary Heritage, but also uh, Rosa Dauto and their um, corresponding teams. Uh, it takes a lot um, to, to, to work together within, within UNESCO and working with these colleagues was effortless, uh, which means that um, uh, they are truly committed uh, to the vision of the Memory of the World program. And uh, it, it, it is always a joy, uh, Rosa, to work, to, to, to work with you. It's not, it's not such a, a difficult undertaking. Uh, and obviously by extension, our colleagues here who have made all this possible. Uh, so I thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. I think we should continue doing this and we'll do greater things. Uh, finally, again, uh, let me recognize uh, your presence and I would like to cede uh, the floor to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like, first of all, to congratulate you all for this wonderful uh, conference. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be here. I am the director of Instituto Guimarães Rosa, the cultural department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Brazil. Um, as it was mentioned before, my predecessor was um, uh, the director of um, Instituto Guimarães Rosa, uh, and now she is the ambassador of Brazil to UNESCO, and she has been doing a great job there especially uh, in these fields of memory and, and all these projects that have to do with the, the uh, archives and uh, documentation of the important uh, history of the world. Uh, the president um, of Brazil now, President Lula, has um, mentioned several times that one of his uh, priorities is uh, with the African continent. Uh, we are in all the instances and levels of the government uh, doing great uh, effort to strengthen our ties with Africa, not only in terms of culture, but also political and commercial and trade affairs. And um, we are very happy that um, our um, friend partners of Palops are here and we are developing great um, projects with them. It is uh, CPLP, as you all know, is a very important uh, uh, international uh, community of countries. And um, in two years, I think, we are going to celebrate uh, an important date of the foundation of CPLP. So we are going to do many projects with them. Um, one of my jobs um, in the Instituto Guimarães Rosa is to foster the uh, multi cultural multilateral affairs, uh, uh, not only at UNESCO, but also G20, Mercosur, and African countries. No? And uh, one of the main um, issues, as mentioned here, is uh, the documentation program, and that's why it's very important to have uh, these projects together with UNESCO, 
not only UNESCO in Paris, but also in Brazil, and also with Arquivo Nacional. So I thank you very much all and congratulate you for your wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Mr. Nakata, Mr. Paxson Banda, and it's closing this event. Please. Thank you. Thank you so much.